Really good to see you. Mm. We've made it to August. Oh. <laughs> really good to see you. Now, just take the time to um, connect with this quilt, wonderful quilt of faces, our friends. Ah, yeah, it's great to see you. Mm. Hope you're all doing, you're all doing well enough to be here. <laughs> it's a big thing. Mm. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Well, so you um, already we can connect with um, how we're experiencing seeing everyone and being here right now. and connecting with our body posture sitting here. Usually we close our eyes, lying, kneeling or sitting, standing. And the emphasis will be on just noticing where our attention is and connecting there. At first, maybe letting the attention go wherever it's called in our bodies. Maybe there's a general sense of our whole body at first, and, and then it's kind of like listening to music, the aliveness of our body. And maybe gradually letting the attention settle somewhere long enough to let ourselves notice a word about the experience like elbow or foot our thigh and landing long enough so that the concept or word about the experience, let the thought come and go and let the attention settle more deeply in that area so that you get a sense of not being in a hurry, no hurry. Take your time. And notice the quality of your awareness. Is there any tenderness or kindness? Or like a very quiet, delicacy, knowing that we're not accustomed to let ourselves not know what these sensations are conceptually. And just allow them to quietly emerge, wordlessly emerge, just as they are. And your attention might kind of roam a bit. Maybe there's a sound and that's some other sensations. Just notice that or thoughts and then just 
come back. This area of the universe is worthy of our attention. And just explore where it's easiest for your attention to land like that for a while. At first it might be with noticing that hearing is happening right now. There's usually some texture to silence. Texture to whatever sounds are appearing, vibration, sound. And again, you, you notice you don't fight or struggle with any thoughts about the sounds. They could be internal or external. And just, just try to land into, settle into not being in a hurry. The attention might be wide, open. And we're receiving the changing textures, vibrations like music flowing. So the words, bird, car, gurgling, silence, they're just words that come and go. And just settle, settle the attention back into, it's like a very tender, quiet abiding with just what's appearing. So whether it's body sensations or sounds, we're getting the sense of this no inside, no outside. Bird, elbow, car, knee, head. They're what we name things, but we miss the direct experience. So you might let the attention settle in with your hands for a while, that area. Amazing textures. That range of soft, rough, smooth, hard, warm, cool, hot, cold, heavy, light, flowing, stuck. Letting those words help us connect more deeply into that quiet abiding with the wordless emerging of life itself.
and that shift we can make at times. So close our hands to our abdomen. Or her having our hand there for a while. And if our hand is there, you can just notice that emerging of the movement there of what we call breath. Just there's no pressure to try too hard. You just let the sensations come into your hands. Less fear that we're not doing it right. And once in a while, we check in with the quality of the awareness, tender, caring, noticing any resisting or accepting. And if you can, letting them both be okay. It's just whatever quietly emerges, the awareness that's accepting or the awareness that's resisting how things are. We can make more space as we allow the thinking to just come and go as it is. With the same understanding that it's just textures and vibrations. a certain shifting soundtrack, black and white color images. Like wind blowing through the trees. simply thinking, just like hearing, breathing. And emotions coming through, caring, peaceful, kind, appreciative joy, there's textures, exploring the nuances and textures within our bodies, minds. And the sadness, the grief, fear, anger, loneliness, shame. It's just like letting the textures and vibrations within our hands emerge or sound 
or the wind passing through. Just getting the sense that whatever appears is not me or I or mine. Reacting, not reacting, not me or I or mine. Peaceful, upset, not me, not I, not mine.
Thank you, Michelle. A few weeks ago, I read a story in the local paper here about a little girl. I think I, like I think she was like eight, down in um, the southern part of the island here, who at the beach came upon a bottle and gathered up and collected it and. Uh, noticed it had like paper in it and stuff in it. And so she and her parents opened it and um, there were all these pieces of paper, some of them very deteriorated um, in different languages with uh, a message indicating that it had been part of a science experiment that uh, 1984 and 1985, the Chiba Prefectural Chosi High School in Japan had a natural science club and they released uh, 750 of these bottles. Somewhere in this North Pacific subtropical gyre <laughs> uh, and the experiment was really to see where they would end up and where they would be found to, to study these ocean currents. And so this kid was, you know, super stoked to find one and it caught a lot of kind of news attention. And it was an interesting article, you know, they, they were saying that um, it's a, there's been 10 found in Hawaii over the years, but this is the first one in almost 20 years that's been found and uh, others have shown up in Washington, Alaska, Guam, California, Japan, the Philippines, Marshall Islands, Hong Kong, somewhere on the mainland China. And actually only 51 of them have been found so far. And there's still almost 700 somewhere. And so this little kid is determined she wants to find another one, you know, at some point. But it was neat. I didn't know what a, a, I'd never really actually heard of the North Pacific subtropical gyre um, and what even is a gyre. You know, it's a large system of rotating ocean currents. Uh, and that is one of the big, there's like five major ones around the planet. And um, it's very powerful. It's like, you know, there's all these, there's a current up to the north, the California current, these currents kind of going all around that get this thing sort of swirling, you know. But it's, of course, very complex, the, the movements of it and what's influencing it. And it's not just that, right? There's all these currents within it that go from shallow to deep and deep to shallow. and um, now they measure it with, you know, little GPS trackers and stuff like that. No more glass bottles tossed in there. It is also the place where this giant garbage patch is of plastic has formed. Uh, and so probably a good number of those 700 bottles are uh, out there <laughs> swirling around with, in good company. very powerful to have a sense of these um, currents that are so real and often invisible in, in, in our direct experience. But you have something like this come along and it's clearly a message from some past time that has tracked a certain path, you know, in these currents. And, and there is something very remarkable in that, you know, and 
And of course, we see that in all kinds of ways right now. You know, with the we have a fire happening up uh, kind of east of us right here, not not in any proximity, but but the fire is really bad today. They're evacuating all kinds of places, and you know, you can see the smoke, you can smell the smoke, you can um, you see how much that the wind currents matter right now. The the trade winds have come back really strong and so that's really causing the storm to to pick up you have the fuel you have the dryness the conditions of it you have the fire and you have this wind and these currents come together in ways that aren't uh, predictable in detail but are also following natural law, you know, that they're they're inevitable in some other way, right? Because you know that these air currents and wind currents and ocean currents and um, weather patterns, you know, these currents of the land and of tectonic plates and the rhythms of shifting and the undulating aspect of even the earth, you know, are all things that we we can notice. our planet moving through space, you know, in the solar system or on the sun and the the changing rhythms of those trajectories, you know, these are these are real things that sometimes if you pay attention and you have the tools and the time and the training they can be observed. Even when I was just traveling for a few weeks, I was in um, Ohio for part of that time and we had those you know, you, the smoke from the Western fires was there. I know it got even as far as the East Coast and Boston and New York. Of course, like the bottle, it's like you're, these places probably very likely always or regularly have, are breathing the air from the West Coast, but you don't notice it until these particles are floating in it and the information about the the rhythms, the patterns, the currents of nature are more discernible. There's a really neat movie I saw some months back, a short film called Plastic Bag by Ramin Barani. You can actually, I think you can watch it. It's just like a 20 minute film you can watch it online plastic bag and it it sort of describes the the journey of this plastic bag from its its first breath as the grocery store uh attendant opens it up and fills it with air and fills it with goods and this woman brings it home and it's sort of contented life at home before at some point she disposes of it and this plastic bag goes on a journey. And the, the, the fascinating part of it is it's narrated from the bag's perspective and it's Werner Herzog, if anyone knows that director and his stern, almost sort of hilarious um, severity. Uh, <laughs> and so from the, from the bag's perspective, there is this sort of volitional aspect to all of it. It's been abandoned. It's wandering through the streets. It's getting stuck in trees. It's it's sort of des you know just unconsolable and it's loneliness. And then it hears about a place far in the ocean where all plastic bags can gather. And there's this heaven of a paradise of plastic, where all all plastic things can come together and be in this universal swirl, you know, in the middle of the ocean. So it makes a, tries to make a journey out there to that. And so you have this, the, the, the beauty of that is you have something that from one perspective looks inevitable. It looks like there's no will involved. This bag is simply on this flow of currents in the wind and in human society and in nature in the water, but it's narrated as if there was sentience and there was 
will and volition involved in, in the direction of this bag. And so, you know, there's of course something very powerful in that around, I think a questioning of our, of who we are and, and what we are and our lives and which part, what aspects of our being are just the movement of conditioned inevitable phenomena knocking one another down a chain of events right how much of our experience of being of life of of all of these things that we we think we are so in charge of and and identify with as our story are sort of interpretations of natural law of of the confluence of currents uh, of ourselves as a gyre, right? Of, of at times may we notice that there is a sense of um, maybe not of air currents or ocean currents, but the currents of, you know, air element, water element, fire element, earth element, in terms of our physical experience, the currents of you know, mind and body of the currents of the six sense doors, the six sense experiences we have. Where are these aspects that are inevitable? Where are the aspects in which there is choice? In which there is something possible beyond or outside of or without regard to that which is also inevitable. During my retreat this last winter, I noticed some um, a little nest under a tree of these little blue eggs, and I wasn't sure exactly, you know, what animal they were from, and there were a few options, and it turned out to be the eggs of a, a feral chicken that had come down the hill from a neighbor's. And so it was, uh, you know, for part of the retreat, it was a very sweet thing to kind of go and check and see this hen on the eggs. And see it go off and come back and this anticipation building. And and I'll say it was very painful uh, at some point when they finally hatched and none of them made it in very long. Some wild being um, killed all the chicks. And I, I wasn't sure, you know, you don't I wasn't sure what the hen would do. But she stuck around and she kept being around and at some point, again, I noticed I could hear her laying eggs somewhere, <laughs> somewhere else in a gulch, you know, further, further out, perhaps a little more protected, and sort of wondered what was going to happen. And so recently, I've seen her with her six little chicks, bopping around, and they've, you know, they've made it this far. So it felt like such a huge relief, you know, a sense of that tragedy. And now, you know, some sense of hope and, and of course, there is this other layers of well, where, where does that lead? Does that, it leads to six more chickens out running around, you know, having more eggs that get eaten or don't get eaten. I started to see where they're scratching around a lot happens to be by where there's a 
leak in the irrigation that I need to fix. And so what does what impact does that have, right? Actually, on their survival for me to fix this leak. These questions of our interconnection, our interrelationship and what's inevitable. Where you'd never see the chicken I have never seen the chicken that decides not to lay more eggs. You know, where where in our lives do we it is it does appear to be something uniquely human, this ability to consider the inevitability of certain directions, of certain actions the eventuality of, of dukkha, of hardship that we know will come from certain things, the ability to, to make different decisions, actually, not, not just out of control, not just out of a, a, a counter force, but through this practice of mindfulness, of, of, of observation, of watching these forces at play in our own hearts and minds, where we see how subject our attention is, how subject our volition is, our intentionality, our actions are to these winds that we receive, right? These, these, the momentum and the, the fluid uh, pressure that we feel to do something next, to, to propel ourselves forward in this world. And that the Dhamma, Vipassana, mindfulness does offer this possibility of letting things come to an end. Now that can be letting your bloodline come to an end. It can be letting hatred come to an end. Letting wanting come to an end. And this very powerful aspect of mind after which these forces, these, these uh, conditions, these currents have no impact. Their energy can dissolve and dissipate. How amazing that is. How amazing that is that we have the ability to observe phenomena and in that observation of uh, you know, something happening in the body, an unpleasant physical sensation arises, there's consciousness arises out of that. These, this unfolding of natural law happens on its own, right? They, these are ultimately, there is this quality to inevitability to them of that which is born will pass away, right? Of fate. This eventualities that we receive and that all of this material phenomena of our, of our lives and all of the phenomena around us are going to be subject to. Like Steve was mentioning last week around these reflections of old age, of sickness, of death. I have, you know, I have not gone beyond old age. I have not gone beyond illness. I have not gone beyond death. All that is dear and delightful to me will change and vanish. And then I am the owner of my actions, heir to my actions, born of my actions, related to my actions, and abide supported by my actions. Whatever action I do, whether good or evil, of that I will become heir. H-E-I-R, I will inherit. The sense there, there is no avoiding the inevitability of old age, of sickness, of death, of, of that which is pleasurable coming to an end. But through this responsibility of kama, we see that 
the inevitable doesn't have to determine what's possible, right? That our fate doesn't have to be our destiny. That there's a capacity of mind that can be free beyond the natural conditions of, of phenomena through understanding, through the ability to observe a painful experience, to observe the unpleasantness of it, observe the consciousness of it, maybe observe the wanting of something else to happen. But in that, not having it to lead to, to grasping, to craving, to clinging, not leading to action based on fear or action based on anxiety, on inability to be with it, action based on greed. There's just this incredible ability to watch it and let it come to an end. Watch pleasant sensation arise and pass and the heart doesn't need to cling. Or if it does cling, we observe that. It doesn't need to lead to grasping, to actions based on craving. And so in this way, we let the natural law of phenomena occur it's not outside of nature, liberation, but it also isn't generative of more of it. And so there's such this possibility in that that's so powerful, you know, and it comes through the recognition, right, that we have this, this observational quality in the moment. And then there is this reflective understanding of, of like, okay, you're watching these things in the moment, but you also get a sense in general of patterns, right? In general of ocean currents and wind currents and the atmosphere of the mind and heart and body and how it's moving. These teachings of the Dhamma that describe this, right? Then with the arising of this comes the arising of that. With the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. When this arises, that arises. When this ceases, that ceases to be. And so we don't have a sense of being able to predict our comma in detail, but we do have the ability to understand the basic patterns, the basic understanding of what kind of actions lead to what kind of outcome. And so you have, just like the weather forecasters, you have models right? The Dhamma models of understanding and then the models of behavior, of sila, of ethical conduct, of trying to abide in that generation of force that is wholesome, that is not rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion, right? That produces wholesome outcomes for ourselves, for others, for the planet. And then you have this observation so not just the doing of that which is good or restraining from that which is harmful, not just the kind of conceptual frameworks and understandings based on reflection, but this immediate ability to stop adding fuel to the fire, to letting the winds die out, to letting the currents cease. And the beauty of that quietude, the rest and the relief when, you know, the Buddha was enlightened and, and it was a ref common refrain when, when people would get enlightened uh, back in the classical days. Done is what had to be done. There's no more coming to any state of being. Right? Done is what had to be done. There's no more generation of ourselves into the future. No more compulsion for that. Things take their natural toll, of course. We don't become immortal. We don't become uh, beyond the natural laws. But that the natural laws, if applied in a certain way, can lead to the ending of this cycle, right? The ending of these currents of these effluents as they're spoken of sometimes, these forces. We see how much energy goes into it. I spent some time with my grandfather last week, who's 93 and really 
doing super well. And of course, his body is old. His, his mental acuity is not so strong. But it, there was an interesting observation he made of one place where he notices something not quite right. That he says he, ha he has a common perception that he's he's not living where he is, where that he's living back east, and that where he is right now is not his home. But he recognizes, of course, it is his home, maybe through reminders or whatever. But he sees this. He sees that there is a, a falling apart of the stability of a certain perception. He wouldn't necessarily language it that way. But I think what I see is how much effort it constantly takes to, to keep stabilizing our perception of things, of this is me, this is my home, this is where I live, this is who this person is. That is an exhausting mental activity that is very functional and, and very helpful for us, right? That we have a conceptual framework of these things, of, of what's called perception. And that that even wears out, right? That maybe it's the, maybe the energy it takes just isn't there anymore. Maybe the sort of trigger for it doesn't fire, you know, whatever may, there are the various phenomena that may occur in the mind, uh, in the brain, right, in the body, whatever, whatever confluence of events that lead to this, it's very powerful. It's very powerful to have it happen and to have even a sense of that it's happening. We may not be familiar. There are times I know where I'm on the road traveling and I'll wake up in the middle of the night and there's, a, there's this period of time where I don't know where I am, you know. It can happen here. It can happen anywhere. And I've, in the last few years, started to see if what it's like to just hang out there. Like before, the sense of needing to, needing to know, needing to land, needing to reestablish that sense of security in here. Oh, I'm here. I am here. And just like, what is it like to lie in the dark? and really not know these things, who I am, where I am. Is there any ability for that to be totally okay? I often think about an interaction I had with this very beloved and famous monk, uh, Mahagosananda, a Cambodian hero, really, you know, a peace activist. And I, I just met him at the, toward the very end of his life when he was living in Massachusetts and there was some folks taking care of him. And he came to a conference of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship out there and he was in a wheelchair and he was like very pr profoundly advanced um, Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, really was was probably living in that something like that space a lot of the time just like not really recognizing anything interpreting it or remembering or you know and he had just the most beautiful countenance he was so quiet and joyful and connected and had this enthusiasm that was very grounded and uh, settling and how inspiring and confusing it was for me of like at that point perhaps I had an idea that oh maybe this would mindfulness might protect you from these things you know ha 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 <laughs> no it can't protect you from the inevitable but that the inevitable doesn't have to determine what's possible is what that showed me. That yes, we will die. Yes, we may totally lose any sense of ourselves. All kinds of things can happen. 
as we all know, in the mind and body. And yet, and there's no predicting that in detail, but there's certainly, it is all basically going to happen at some point. And yet, the freedom that we aspire to, and that is the promise of this, is outside of that. It is not affected by that. There is a freedom that is untouched by those realities. And how beautiful, how beautiful to think that we might be okay with losing everything. We, we have to. I mean, that has to be the goal. That has to be what enlightenment is. Afraid of losing everything around us, afraid of losing everything internally, afraid of dying, you know, no, no fear of dying, of losing life, of existence, that we're unperturbed by that. Rather than what, of course, we all see mostly in ourselves and in others is, is the lingering preoccupations, the patterns of fear, of anxiety, right? Most people, many people we see with Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that, that that confusion is scary, right? That confusion is very disorienting in a, in a very painful way, of course, right? Or when the, the sort of governor is gone, these other patterns emerge, you know, that we may have kind of locked in on or hidden away, but but they're there because we haven't been able to spend the time or skillfulness with being able to understand them, appreciate them, bring kindness to them, understand these cycles enough so that we actually stop propagating them, propelling them forward. And so this is our practice, right? We know it and we try it and uh, we try our best, you know, to observe these phenomena, observe these cycles, observe these things, and um, to just remember how beautiful a possibility it provides us and how it provides us no protection from the inevitability. And how those two things can both be true. And that this process is wonderful and mysterious. And there's something about that little girl just finding this bottle on the beach and, and, and fathoming it, like really understanding what this meant. Right? That many, many years for her, you know, for me, 1984 is a memory. For her, that's like, Way some it's like very distant. And yet getting that this thing has traveled all this way and it's reached her and it's moving and she wants to know more, right? She wants to understand more, to have a sense of what it is to receive these messages from the past, to 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 get a glimpse of these currents. And that our practice can be like that. We can have that relationship every time we observe something and we fathom how far it's come, what it's taken to arrive here. And the joy in that, right? The fulfillment in that understanding. is something very important for us to keep motivating our practice forward. Mm. So that's it for this little offering today. And we do have some time for uh, questions. If anyone has any, uh, it can be questions about your practice, your meditation practice at home, about the instructions Michelle offered today, um, anything I might have offered. Just feel free to, you can go down to the reactions button and there should be a little thing that says wait raise hand you can raise your hand there if if you can't find that you can just type something into the chat and we'll, we'll notice that you have a question and we'll call on you
Hi, Beth. Oh, let me make sure everyone can unmute themselves. There we go. You can unmute yourself now. Let's see. Um, yeah. Maybe on the bottom left. Okay. Oh, yes, got it. Great. Yes. Okay, goody. <clears throat> Just two short Maha Gosananda stories. All right. One is very similar to yours. It was another conference at the end of his life. And Blanche Hartman from Zen Center was there. And Maha's mind was completely, completely gone. I mean, just completely gone. You know, and he had people with him and he was in a corner. And what she said, and this was always true about Maha. Maha's how I got to Cambodia um, in 1996, yeah. Um, that the power of his loving kindness, even under those circumstances, absolutely filled that hall. It just, it was what remained. And then just, um, I have a little reservation about saying this, but it's a little bit of a caveat that that happened when Maha felt safe that when he felt vulnerable and he felt hugely vulnerable a lot of the time, then it was really, really painful. But when he felt safe, then there was nothing else but that loving kindness. And that had always been like the overriding thing. You know, it's what he brought everywhere he went. It's just that the ability to dwell in it wholeheartedly and in peace became more difficult as his capacities failed. And what's amazing about that is that it is what remained. And that he was supported in his life to the end of his life, because most of us didn't know what happened when they took him away from Cambodia. Um, and he was very afraid to go. Um, so every time I hear one of these stories, it's just so, incredibly heartening because that's what was there. It was vulnerable. It wasn't impervious. It wasn't, you know, all of those vulnerabilities you were talking about, but the moment he was safe, you know, it was what radiated through him was just so much power and love. It was so, you know, so I'm very grateful you told the story. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, thank you so much for offering that. I just, I feel like it's so important. There's a tendency, I think, that is common amongst many of us of, of over... That in order to recognize the holiness in someone we can't also recognize the complexity in someone and the, the imperfections or the whatever the, the you know what however you would want to frame it the humanity and the the reality of just what it's like to be human and and that someone could even have access to that in such a powerful way and it's what remained as you said yeah and and it's and not needing not to, to over it right it's, it's really important not to reify it Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because then it becomes objectified. It becomes a thing. It becomes unobtainable. It becomes, you know, just another piece of comma. Right. And not, yeah. Okay. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Really super important. Mm. Mm. 
Michelle, did you want to say anything about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, supporting everybody to notice when there's that tendency to want someone to be different than they are, especially when it's some idea that we have of what enlightenment is, <laughs> that I think that that... Um, creates an atmosphere for us all of an idea of what enlightenment is versus what it really is. You know, so that sense of um, equally valuing that our awareness can be with resistance or acceptance or peace or rage. It's like it really fits in, the story fits into how we are attempting to offer the teachings because it's it's the truth. It's like it to have this idea that um, that we discount maybe somebody's awakening because they're not fitting into our idea of how they should be is um, a great loss for all of us. or if somebody's pretending to be something that they're not when they're teaching, again, it, it's like, it's a great loss for all of us. Because you're not, you're not teaching people how to be with how things are versus how we think they should be, you know? So thank you, yeah. I guess I want to add to this because it could be confusing to some people, but freedom really depends on if we're identified with experience, not what's happening. So that 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 wisdom that we understand that if if say shame appeared and we're not identified with it, we don't have a sense that it's me or I or mine, then there is a liberation possible with that experience. But if we think shame shouldn't happen if you're awake, then that you see there's this um, resistance, there's identification and there's more karma from that believing it to be an experience to be mine or I. Uh, and it's very hard to tell sometimes from the outside when we're with someone, if that's you know someone who um, is said to be free, more free or free, I think it's very hard to see sometimes. Sometimes you can only see it in behavior uh, over a long period of time. Sayada Upandita always used to say, if somebody thinks they've had a, an awakening experience, he said, watch them for five years. Five years. So that's, that's important. <laughs> not one year, not two. That's a long time to watch somebody. Make sure they're not hiding something in that shadow world. <laughs> Easy to do. Hi, Julia. Oh, are you there? Your, your screen might be a little frozen. Hmm. You want to try turning off your video, if you can hear me? Hi. Oh, OK. Um, am I OK now? You Have are. You your video? I can hear you. Yeah. OK. I, um, I, I just need some help with this, um, and it's going to the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of uh, aging. 
my four-year-old granddaughter today said to me, Grandma, am I going to die? And uh, so we looked out of, you know, we were going to a, we were at a park, going to a park to swim and the, the leaves were dying because it's very dry here. And I said, you know, so you did that nature thing. Stop there. And then she came back to it three or four times. Grandma, I'm afraid of, I'm going to die. And then again, am I going to die? And there was real fear in her voice. I, I said, have you talked to your mom and dad about, yes, mom says I'm not going to die. Um, I didn't know how to handle it. I wonder if you might have some advice. I think it's, it's telling that her mother's answer did not satisfy her <laughs> intuitive knowledge, right? That, that something else is, is happening. I mean, I, I think, I don't think I could speak generally about children and these kinds of, you know, any kinds of conversations. I think in, what I would say is it's very specific, in my experience, any of these types of conversations are very specific to the child and to the sense of what is going on here, right? And, and there's fear and oh we lost her well we'll continue the yeah we can, she, we can say it because she can watch yeah, the continue video continue yeah. yeah um the sense that everyone is different and every adult is different in terms of how you're going to have conversations about hard things with them or, or teenagers or, or whatever, you know? So I just, I really do feel that like there is the truth that is important, that it, there is something very fundamental about being honest and being truthful and that kids in particular can be very sensitive to. And um, at the same time, I think there are ways of, framing it or having the conversation like this that are more digestible for for someone and so i, I don't feel like i have a, a a sort of general sense of like well at a four-year-old a four-year-old should hear this or whatever i mean i think it's very not every four-year-old thinks about it right and then so it's kind of amazing to have a four-year-old who's like really takes it understands there's something very serious about this and that at the same time you also want to be very careful that she's so perturbed by it and 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 is shaken by it and that something about that feels like an important thing to 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 negotiate in terms of being honest but also being careful and sensitive i think there's all i mean kids can often have far out conversations about well who is it what are who are you you know is will your body change or your body get old or your mind like what what is death what is life what are these things i mean i think that there's a lot of ways to have meaningful conversations with with young people about the whole picture and that death is going to be part of that picture but that there's actually a lot of other elements that don't have to be so jarring and that might the conversation about nature, about body, about mind, about uh, cycles in nature, et cetera, you know, they can be very powerful conversations to have, even in other traditions or, you know, about heaven or about, it's like there's ways of framing uh, all of the information around it so that that particular question, am I going to die, doesn't have to feel um, so burdened, so heavy, so so fearful um, while at the same time existential. <laughs> I don't know, Michelle, what do you? Oh, your microphone is down. Sorry, it's such an interesting thing because I do think, I agree that it really depends on the kid. It just totally depends on the kid and each, you know, what each circumstance you can't say this is a, this is how, one should answer a question like that. But I did actually have my, she was four or five, my great niece 
um, her uncle had died and she'd just been at the funeral and I was visiting and um, she came up to me um, and she said, Auntie Michelle, nobody will talk to me about what happened. And, you know, well, I don't understand. And I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand why no one will talk about this with me. You know, so, you know, I took her kind of away from everybody and we had a like incredible conversation, not just like a let's talk about this a bit. I asked her, you know, um, if she, I, I kind of went through a few people in the family and I said, well, what do you think that this aunt would say to you about it? Or, you know, what do you think your mom and the, across the board, it was like, no one wants to talk about it. And so I said, well, um, so therefore, like, if we're going to have this conversation, I don't want you to really go running to all of these people and tell tell them about it. I said, you know, it's it's fine to go individually and say to your mom, what do you think about death and what happens or to your aunt? But I wouldn't necessarily want you to kind of advertise an hour long conversation <laughs> about it, because I tend to be the, the person in the family that is suspicious, you know, for talking too much about this um, subject in in general but i i do want to offer that i i really just presented like um this aunt will pro if you talk to her about you she really believes when you die you would go to heaven mm -hmm. and i explained that a bit and then she said well what do you think and i said well that's a great can of worms you know this will be fun and i described what i felt that happens, you know, and I really talked about it. I said, in my um, understanding, at the moment you die, you take birth again into another body. So I said that that really is not so much of a um, permanent death, but that there's a rebirth. I really explained it in very close, very detail about it with her. And she was fascinated. She was just fascinated by it. Um, and I said, your body, in my sense, your body will die, this body, but then unless you have come to a deep peace with everything, she, she followed it. Kids aren't stupid. She followed it. I said, then um, you would take birth again. And she thought about it. And she said, well, what a, she, she kind of got it. And she said, well, what do other people think around that? And I said, well, there are other um, Buddhists that believe that you don't take rebirth right away that it takes 40 days um, and that there's a long period like that where you're kind of going through all kinds of um, adventures <laughs> and learning a lot on the level without a body and um, so I had explained different traditions to her and then she she thought about it and I said so what do you think so far and she said um I like the one where it sounds like you have a rest. She said, I like the 40 days. I would take it as a rest, like I would try to sleep a lot and rest for, until the next time I had to have a body. And I said, great, you know, it's like, and what, what was interesting, it be, because I think a lot of the fear is that people won't talk about it. My, my mom died when I was young, no one would talk about it. It's scary when no one talks about it. She felt like by the time I finished, she felt so, I think, complete, like there was enough already. I don't know if she thought about it again, probably for a couple of years. I mean, that was a lot, right, to take in. And kids don't always take it in conceptually. They take it in how you're saying it. And I was doing a lot of metta. I was holding her hand. We kind of walked and sat again. I was just filling her space with metta because most of the fear is is because, you know, we just don't know. And uh, I think just presenting with a child that there's different ways people um, have come to grips with this, then they tend to settle down. You know, she did. I can't. And again, but if it was a kid that I felt like wasn't up for it, I might not, I might just um, shift to metta in some way, you know, loving kindness and reassuring, her, reassuring. It's like, I know, I'll tell one my story. When I, when I was a kid, there was this uh, time when we were um, really kind of 
in that place where it seemed like we might be bombed and we were little but we would always go to the bomb shelter when we were in school and all these exercises about getting bombed and one time I went home and I, and I told my mom that I was really kind of scared and um, she sat me down and she said she, this was the only time my mom ever reassured me in my life but she sat me down and she said just know that I really don't feel that's going to happen until you it might happen when you're really old. She said, I'm not sure, I can't tell, but I don't think it's gonna happen until you're old or maybe after you die. And, and I said, really? And she said, I don't think so, I'm not sure, but it, I think that's what I think. And I felt totally okay, right? Like she, she leveled with me. She told me what she felt and that like, it, I just thought, okay, it was good enough, you know? <laughs> You have to kind of listen to what a kid is sort of wanting. And my great niece was really, she was wanting information. She wanted to hear like all these ways that you could hold dying and death. And other kids might just want to be told, you know, yeah, it happens. It's okay. You know, let's go, you know, play hopscotch. You know, it, it, it really just depends on the kid. I, and I think I want to just yeah. tag on to something you said there, Michelle, of just there's this other factor right now that I don't feel super tuned into, but I'm sure is very real of coming out of these year and a half of COVID and wherever it's going. And how has that affected children in in this planet, right? I mean, I think it's just like, it's across the board. There's probably so many ways that the the children have been affected and and a lot of that's going to have to do with how their parents are anxious or not about death or anxious or not about disease and getting sick and covid and and so i i just think that like we have been in a time of this pandemic and a lot of just high intensity emotions around fear around anger around volatility and this like this idea of death as this random could happen any time, like it's a, a bombing, or, you know, it's, it has the same feeling as sort of from that, that era, Michelle, you're talking about, um, that I'm undeniably is going to have had a huge impact on these generations. And, um, you know, those are, again, it's, it's, it is still going to be very individual, but I do think that that's something to consider of course, if children are around us, grandchildren, our own children, or just nieces and nephews, kids around of like, just kind of like the going back to what Beth was saying about Mahagosananda, it's like, when he, when he felt safe, there was access to all this metta. When he didn't feel safe, there was there more vulnerability and more fear and whatever might come with that. And that we all are like that, <laughs> except perhaps with less like, capacity around aspects of it right and so that sense of like are we tuned into the vibe of our presence right are we do, are we sending meta when we have these conversations when we're when we're talking about covid or talking about illness or talking about death and there's children around of course the sense of like what are we what are we filling the air with and what are we filling the room with and um what are the reverberations that that has in a, in a child's mind? Um, it's, it's perhaps more important than what words you actually use or, you, or say. It's going to be our own fear of death is going to be the biggest player in whatever conversation we have with a kid about their fear of death. And so the better we are with that, the more healthy and full and vulnerable and open and dynamic relationship we have with it, the more we'll be able to have that with with someone who feels much more vulnerable and, and is in a more tender, more more tender place in their lives. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, I just also want to say that when we don't tell the truth on some fundamental level to a very open little being, 
I think it has a big effect. And I'm, I'm, I tell stories just to kind of try to get it across. But I, like when I was really little, um, you know, I was probably three or something. My, my mom told me that if I uh, swallowed a, the seed of a tangerine or an orange that I would die. <laughs> And I like, I believed her. And so one time I was like, you know, off and eating a little tangerine. You know, when you're a kid, a tangerine's amazing. It takes forever to get, you know, all the little outside part off. And, you know, and I, by mistake, I swallowed the tangerine. And in my family, I wasn't going to tell anybody because they would have blamed me. You know, I would have thought it was, my, you know, all my fault that I was going to die, right? I was like already terrified that they would hate me even if I died. But it, I was for hours like terrified that um, not only was I going to die, but they would hate me even when I was dead. It was so funny. But when I didn't die, just think about that like this. When I didn't die... I wrote off my mother, like on a level that I can't even tell you, like her authority diminished in terms of her being like a, a safe kind of a person for advice, right? And I think that's really what's critical here. If, if, you're, if you're four and you ask somebody if you're gonna die and they say no, and, you know, by four in our culture, we're exposed to all kinds of conversations and media. And we're seeing, I mean, if you're four, by four, I'd seen all kinds of death outside. You know what I mean? It's like, you see, everything's dying, gonna die. You get it. That's why you're asking. <laughs> you're scared because you know, that's why they have like, you know, when I was a kid, the cartoons were, full of death. I, I just can't, I don't get it. I don't get why one would lie about it. But I think there are kids you would say it and then try to reassure and distract for sure. But a lot of it, there's plenty of people 80 years old that are afraid to die. Right? It doesn't matter what age we are. This is the great Buddhist teaching. I mean, this is the whole thing. This is it in a nutshell. Every, everything that takes birth, whether you're a god or a goddess or a worm or a human, we're going to die. How could we possibly lie about that? I don't know. I don't, I think if you're okay with that, that's true, then, then the kid's going to feel it they're going to feel that you're okay with it. And then they're going to just go on. They're going to do 10 million other things in the next hour at four years old. There's a saying in Hawaii that I love. It's called Make died dead. And it, it means <laughs> it's sort of like you say somebody died three times. It's or something died. It's not like that they died. They, they it's like they Maki died dead. They're like they're dead, right? It's like and it's so cool. It's just like I don't I don't know if I can put it totally into words, but it's like a way in which um somewhere somewhere in the culture there's so much more allowing and accepting that that something dies it not only dies once it dies three, like it three times for sure right and it's so so refreshing like you can feel people can get very mor morose when we talk about death or like really really like depressed and it just doesn't have to be like that Okay, one more, it's, you know, the happy side of Mia Tung Saido. Um, that great, great thing, you know, that he taught about how to practice, you know, when the, the, on the end, I asked him what his practice was, he was like 92 or three, and he said, on the in breath, I just say, everyone I know is going to die. And on the out breath, I say, I too will die. 
That's like fundamental Buddhist meditation practice on the in-breath, rising movement. Everyone I know will die on the out-breath, falling movement, and I too will die. And then there was this long pause, and he said, and you know what? <laughs> I said, what? And he said, when I die, I'm not going to be surprised. <laughs> it's like, it was so infectious, like that utter, like, acceptance and joy of that acceptance. And the, like that you're connected that much to the truth of things, right? You're so connected to the truth. <laughs> or somebody like Sri Nazarikadatta. Maharaj, he said, he begged, I beg you, I beg you not to accuse me of being born. I beg you not to accuse me of dying. He was so not identified with his body as being me or I or mine. So not identified with his mind, his awareness as being me or I or mine. He was not identified with his awareness, with his mental state. Uh, consciousness with a body don't accuse me don't accuse me of being born don't accuse me of dying there is no being born there is no dying now that's the truth and that's part of what we're doing in meditation practice is is exploring our body our body like getting oh it's earth air fire and water it's not ours a lot of people want to go right to awareness and right to the mind, whereas if you understand your body, you won't be identified with any of it. it. We're borrowing earth, we're borrowing air, we're borrowing water, we're borrowing, we're borrowing it. It's a loan. It's a gift. It's something to understand before we die. <laughs> That's what we're doing, folks. So why lie to a kid? They might die at five. They might die at 95. That's what Jesse's talk was all about. Kama. But most of us really want to think it's not going to happen to us. <laughs> it's one of our great, you know, comedies and tragedies. It's good. It's good that it's going to happen to everyone else. Okay, but not my, not me. You know, that's what we do mostly. So we have to accept that about ourselves and our humanity. That it's hard. I'm not trying to lighten the fact that it's difficult. <laughs> To, to understand this. But it's very motivating. Hopefully it's very motivating to pay attention, to, to, to understand. That's what I offered my great niece. I didn't tell her how it was. I, I described all these things and asked her what she thought. Maybe next year I'll ask her what she thinks now. Right? It's get people interested. I tried to get her interested. If we're afraid of death, let's try to get interested in it. It's fascinating. Hopefully we'll see you all next week. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> I hope everyone's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> We're checking. <laughs>
And Julia, I know you just came back in, but we'll make sure you can watch the video because we did talk about it more. So we'll, we'll, we'll send it to you to make sure you can see it on when oh, we put it up on I, I kept coming in and out. It was frustrating. Yeah. But I, I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's not your fault. I appreciate very much your going into it because it seemed to be the other end of the scale. And I do appreciate it. And you're, sure. it, you're thinking I'm certainly not going to be telling lies about this either. So <laughs> I needed a way to express the truth with some gentleness. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Great. Yeah.